Good morning, everyone. I've just uh, I've just started the recording of this lecture. Thank you for connecting to the class. Welcome, everyone. Good to see others are coming in. Okay. All right. Let's uh, take a moment to pray, and then we will get started in this class on urban church planting. I would. Uh, yeah, request someone, Aaron, can you please pray and then we will start. Sure, Pastor. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. Lord, as we um, begin with our studies, Lord, um, empower us all with your spirit and um, Lord, transform us inside and out in, in, uh, into your likeness. So Lord, uh, bless us all. And Lord, I submit the rest of the class into your loving hand. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Today, um, th so yesterday, we completed that section on the practical aspects of uh, church planting. Uh, we basically made a complete journey starting from how you do the survey. So as, as you're preparing to go and start a local church or uh, a ministry, it doesn't have to be a church. It could be any kind of Christian ministry. Kind of just give out a simple, you know, uh, uh, an overview of the journey that we would make. And we talked about how you prepare your, get your core team together. How do you do the survey phase? You know, the pre-launch, uh, things that you would do before you launch, how you do your survey, uh, the launch of the uh, church, uh, how you would do outreaches, uh, urban missions or urban evangelism, how, some ideas on different ways that you could plan, and then how you would um, prepare for uh, the the growth of the church as the as a local church grows or as the ministry grows it goes through uh, various stages and how you prepare for that and you prepare for branching and multiplication uh, so that the work continues to grow and yesterday we talked a little bit about uh, different you know different models that we've that you know that we see around uh, in different regions or parts of the world there is no one set model uh, there is no you know that this is the only way to do church uh, but it's it's just nice to look at the way things have happened especially in more recent years how churches have or churches are leveraging technology uh, as part of their um, their uh, way of reaching people and serving people and it's good to know uh, those things. Uh, at the same time, we must be aware of the downsides. You know, technology is not a not something that can cure everything, or is not uh, is not uh, uh, the answer to every problem. Uh, there are challenges. There are downsides to it as well, and we must be aware of it. And uh, we addressed some of that yesterday. You know, one of the one of the things is that. Uh, 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 technology gives. Uh, I mean, the good side is technology gives pl uh, a platform and access to lots of, m not more people, which is a good thing. But the downside is uh, it, something like that could also be harmful for certain people, meaning if they don't know how to handle uh, extra visibility, extra prominence, extra influence, uh, then it's a huge downside. And uh, it, those are some things that we have seen. Uh, 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 in churches that they just grew rapidly, uh, and uh, but then they couldn't handle the uh, the influence that comes through rapid growth through the use of technology, and then that really resulted in uh, 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 a self destruction, so to speak, of the ministry. So today uh, we want to shift now to the next section which is the spiritual side of uh, 
church planting. So we focus a lot on the practical side. Okay, you know, here are all the different things that you can think about as you are going going on to do the, the a church plant, a ministry. But now we also want to talk about the spiritual side of things. Then after that, we will talk about the personal life, uh, how you can personally prepare. And then we want to talk about looking forward, you know, given where, where things are. So that will be our last section uh, when we come to that, uh, given where things are, how do we move forward from here in terms of church planting and so on. So we want to, we will spend some time on that uh, later on in the course. So I have um, released the uh, notes for this section on, uh, on spiritual aspects. So I'm going to just go ahead and share that and then uh, we will go through it. Now, now I, 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 I do want to mention here that uh, uh, when talking about spiritual aspects, I'm not going into all the details on, you know, uh, prayer and you know, so we have a separate course on prayer and intercession that I think uh, we've done in the first year or second year, I forget, but, you know, it's done uh, earlier, a detailed course on prayer. So I'm not going into, you know, a detailed thing on how uh, this is uh, everything that goes into praying and so on. Uh, but um, we don't want to, you know, just remind us and show us, okay, here are things that we keep in mind as we deal with church planting, right? The spiritual side. So that's what we want to do in this course, in this lesson or this section. I just remind us of some, some important things, you know, as we go about planting, doing church planting in urban centers. Now, so I've, I've titled this chapter as uh, the real battle for souls is a spiritual battle. So we understand that, you know, while we are going to plant a church or start a ministry in an urban center, um, and we, you know, it's good to learn the practical side of things, which we have spoken. The real battle for souls, the real battle for the lives of people is a spiritual battle. Uh, there is a spiritual battle going on. Uh, Satan is it has influence over or is carrying out his work over cities. God is at work in our cities, but the devil also is doing things in our cities. All kinds of demonic activities also happening. So in the spiritual realm, things are happening. And we cannot you know, ignore that. We can't pretend that it's all about just natural things. No. So when you look in the Bible, we see spiritual beings or demonic powers influencing leaders. So whether you look at Babylon or the Tyre, King Tyre, the King over Tyre or other cities, you'll find that um, there are demonic influences affecting the leaders of these regions. Uh, and, and this is only representative. So we could safely assume that, you know, this is happening in many other cities of the world. So what is Satan doing in the cities? How is he working? You know, uh, what must we be aware of? And uh, all of what I'm going to say, I think, is more of a reminder because you would have studied this uh, in the course on prayer and intercession. We know that Satan is blinding the minds of people, right? And uh, I'm quickly just going to mention here, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, uh, Paul writes, you know, if a gospel is hid, it is hid to those who are perishing. So if people don't hear the gospel, they are perishing. He's talking about their, their eternal destiny. And then he says in verse 4, in whom? The God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine into them. So what is Satan doing? He's blinding the minds of people. He's trying to prevent them, like put a curtain to prevent them from encountering the light of the gospel, experiencing the light of the gospel. So that's part of Satan's work. And how would he go about doing it? He would go about doing it, of course, through, you know, deceptions, 
uh, are wrong ideas and wrong philosophies and wrong you know thinking that begins to uh, prevail over the people in that city or that region or that community so that that those wrong ideas those wrong thoughts act like a curtain act like a whale on the minds of people that, that's an attempt to prevent them from receiving the light of the gospel um, it's very interesting in Matthew chapter 4 verse 16 it's uh, talking about the land of uh, Zebulun and Naphtali if you turn with me there in Matthew 4 um, uh, let's just uh, I just want to point something out there in Matthew chapter 4 I think if you read the preceding verse Matthew 4 uh, if you read verse uh, uh, let's read verses 13 to 16 somebody could read that for us please Matthew 4 13 to 16 could that somebody read that for us okay and having Nazareth and leaving Nazareth he came and dwelt in Capernaum which is by the sea in the region of Jebelun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Jebelun and land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in the darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. Mm. All right, I want you to notice in verse 13, something interesting. Jesus left Nazareth and came to Capernaum. So he moved cities. So he was growing up in Nazareth all this while. You know, that was his home city or hometown, you could say. And then at the time for, came for him to start his ministry. After he was baptized, he went, you know, in the River Jordan, he went 40 days uh, praying in the wilderness, came back, and then he relocated. He moved from Nazareth into Capernaum. Capernaum was a little further up north, close by the by the Sea of uh, Gennesaret. Or, so he, he moved up, and so he went to that city. And uh, so there's a physical movement. There's a physical movement of Jesus, but in the spiritual, something's happening. So verses 15 and 16 is telling us what's happening spiritually. Spiritually saying, land of Zebulun and Naphtali, that means, so this is the region, right? This is like a district area or region. So Jesus moves to Capernaum, which is in the, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. And he says, okay, you, the people who are living in darkness, have seen great light. Obviously, that's spiritual. There's a physical movement, but there's an impact in the spirit. Light comes. Spiritually, light comes into this place. The people who are in the region of the shadow of death, light has dawned. Now, that is very interesting. And now Jesus spoke about you and me, and he said, you are the light of the earth. Uh, you are the light of the world. He spoke about you and me as believers. Ephesians 5 also says, you know, we are light. We were once darkness, now we are light in the Lord. So that is, of course, spiritual. In the natural, he moved physically. And then something happened. Then in the spiritual, light came into that region. So I'm just pointing that out to say that, you know, uh, physically, yeah, there's a relocation, there's a movement, we are doing something. But spiritually, we are coming in as light, you and I, as believers. We are light, and we are coming in. We are bringing the light of the kingdom. We bring the light of the gospel into the regions where we are. Right. So uh, Satan is working, keeping people in darkness, uh, keeping people blinded, um, and uh, but we are people who bring light. And same thing in Acts 26, 14 to 18, God tells 
to you know uh, Paul at that time he was Saul in his encounter with Jesus says I'm going to send you as a you know, as a to to, uh, to to the Gentiles to bring them from darkness to light from the power of Satan unto God to open blind eyes so spiritually when we uh, when we bring the gospel that's what we are doing we are opening blind eyes we are bringing people out of darkness into light from the power of Satan to God right? Revelation 12 9 talks about Satan going about to deceive the nations he's a uh, old serpent the deceiver so that's his tactic he deceives nations so how is Satan working in the region you know in a city is through blinding blinding the minds of people through deception which could be uh, through ideas philosophies uh, th thoughts uh, patterns uh, could be even sometimes through individuals who exert spiritual influence over people so that's the first thing to keep in mind secondly what else does the enemy do he holds people in bondage that is spiritual prison so uh, it's not you know it's not i mean we can think about prisons that where people are held captive but satan does that spiritually right so these spiritual prisons we talk refer to them as strongholds or bondages or areas of demonic domination uh, are, are, are prevalent over the city uh, in various forms through immorality and sinful deeds uh, social evils like prostitution, corruption, trafficking, uh, all of these are expressions of uh, the spirits of disobedience at work. So we know, we know okay, so there's the other thing that Satan does. He holds people in bondage. He likes to take prisoners, people as prisoners, uh, bondage to fear, bondage to all kinds of things. Right? So that's another activity. Thirdly, uh, Satan would directly attack uh, or directly oppose the proclamation of the gospel through various ways. So that's another part of what the enemy does, right? He uh, tries to hinder the church, hinder God's people from proclaiming the gospel uh, through either through opposition or through direct attacks or persecution. So that's again part of what Satan does, hindering the proclamation of the gospel in the city. And fourthly, we must also be aware that Satan is not only, you know, blinding the minds of people or trying to hold people as spiritual prisoners or trying to oppose or hinder the preaching of the gospel, but he may even try to infiltrate into the church in the city right so we must be aware of these things especially okay satan is going to try to actually come into the church so he's like you know he is this is his offense against offensive against the church right? how do we know this when we look into revelation chapters two and three we find that for at least four of these churches, when the Lord Jesus is speaking to them, he points out specifically to them what Satan is doing in their city. To the church in Smyrna, he says, you know, uh, there's the synagogue of Satan, and the devil, Satan, is going to cause some of the believers from the church in Smyrna to be put in prison. So Satan, he's, he's opposing, he's coming against the church with persecution to the point some of them will be put into prison. And the church in Pergamos, uh, the Lord Jesus tells them, you know, I know your city, uh, it's a place where Satan's throne is and where Satan is dwelling. So God, the Lord is very aware that, you know, this church is in a place where there's a lot of demonic activities. So Satan's throne is there. That means he's got, he's, he's well established in his influence over there. Satan himself dwells there. Um, and the Lord also warns the church and he points out there is a doctrine of Balaam that's infiltrating the church, causing people to, you know, go away from God. 
So he warns them, hey, just like, you know, Balaam, how he taught the people to sin and commit uh, idolatry and immorality, that same kind of doctrine is coming into the church. So he tells the church, be careful. In the church in Thyatira, there's a false prophetess, Jezebel, who's gotten into the church and she's seducing the people. She's seducing believers, getting them to commit immorality. And, and the Lord warns the church. Yeah. And the church in Philadelphia, this is in chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord tells them, look, there's a there's a group that belongs to Satan, the synagogue of Satan, but he tells them, you know, I will cause them to come and bow before the church. That means the church is going to, ex uh, is going to dominate those people, ex uh, exercise dominion over that people. So the point that we can see in, in all of these references is, the church is in the city, but in the city, Satan is also at work. And he's going to try to come against the church. He's going to try to infiltrate the church through false doctrine or come into the church through false prophets or teachers. Um, and Satan may even try to come against the church, but the church can be, like the church in Philadelphia, the church can be in a place of dominion. So in the city, understand these four operations. You know, Satan is blinding the minds of people. He's holding people in bondage. Uh, he's in trying to hinder the proclamation of the gospel. He's trying to weaken the church uh, by infiltrating the church. So what must the church do in the city, right? spiritually speaking? Well, part of our responsibility is to go on the offensive, to be light in the city, to advance the kingdom of God, to counteract and to spiritually oppose, spiritually dismantle what Satan is doing. So in the church planting work, while we are doing all the natural things that we have spoken about, there must also be this understanding that we are in a spiritual battle and uh, we also have to engage the enemy spiritually through using the authority that God has given to us, uh, using the, uh, the, the authority we have in Christ to overthrow the works of the enemy, and, to pro and we must proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ so that people can come out of darkness into the, the light of God. Right? So I've just listed scriptures here uh, that talk about you know, the fact that uh, you know, even as was spoken of Jesus and which is now extended through the church, we are a light to the Gentiles. And Jesus said, you know, we can bind. You know, when we want to ent enter the strong man's house, we bind the strong man or we overcome the strong man so that we can then spoil his goods. So that's part of what we do. We overcome the strong man. Matthew 16, 18 to 19, Jesus said, I will build my church. I'll give them the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, and we bind and lose on earth. So, uh, and he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So the church has been already positioned to be in dominion over the works of the enemy. And uh, 2 Corinthians 10, we know, Paul said, the weapons of our warfare, you know, with those weapons, we can pull down strongholds. We can cast down imaginations. So using our spiritual weapons, the word of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the authority of Jesus' name, the power of the blood of Jesus, the prayer intercession, we exert influence over the things that Satan is doing to blind the minds of people and so on. So this is the church's responsibility on in the spiritual side. Okay, so in this first uh, chapter here on, on the spiritual aspects, I just want to bring our attention to the fact that when we are working in the city, there is the spiritual battle as well that we must engage with. And of course, we'll talk about some practical ways to go about doing it. But we are here in the city and we must, uh, we have the responsibility of countering what the enemy is doing spiritually. Okay. So let me pause here and see if there are any questions so far, any comments so far. Uh, everyone's with me. Any questions? 
Any comments so far? Okay. So if there are no questions, uh, we will uh, okay, see your responses in the chat. Let's move forward, please. We will go. Yeah. So how do we pray and exercise authority uh, for spiritual transformation? Right. So while we are going about doing all the uh, natural things we talk, spoke about, we must also pray, engage in prayer, in worship, and the exercise of spiritual authority for the people in our city. Now, of course, we, we know we cannot control people's will or dictate their choices. We cannot manipulate people. Uh, each person has to make their own decision to believe. Uh, we can't force people to believe. But through prayer and the exercise of spiritual authority, what are we doing? We are facilitating. So this is what we are doing. We are facilitating, uh, uh, making it easier for people to make the decision. Right, so we are not we are not saying that we are going to you know manipulate people uh, and force them to accept Jesus. That we cannot do, but we can diminish Satan's influence. We can diminish uh, the deception. We can diminish uh, uh, demonic influence so that uh, people are free or make it easier for them to respond to the gospel of Christ. Right? So that's what we are doing. Okay, we are not manipulating people's will to force them to accept Christ. So how do we do this? Um, when we are interceding for people, uh, we are praying. Right. So we are praying, and we will talk about you know some of the things we will pray for. And this comes more as a reminder. So we are praying for the Lord, uh, to the Lord for His work, and He has taught us what to pray for. So we pray. We're also going in an offensive spiritually against the devil. So that means we're going straight against the devil, against his demonic powers, uh, operating uh, through presence, and through worship, and through the exercise of spiritual authority. So remember when we began this course, in the very introduction, we said, what is our goal? We want to establish communities of believers that will host the presence of God in that place. You know, so really, we want to be a house of uh, uh, where God dwells. So the presence of God is established in the community, and uh, spiritually, we do this through prayer, through worship, and through exercising spiritual authority uh, over what the enemy is doing. So, when we pray, what uh, what do we pray for? And I just listed these things out here uh, that we could use as we lead our congregations in prayer, uh, praying over the city, praying over the region that we are engaged with. Uh, we pray and ask God, ask Him for the region as an inheritance, right? So Psalm 2 and verse 8, He said, Ask of me, I will give you the, the heathen, I will give you the nations for your inheritance. So he said, ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. So he began to ask, Lord, I want the city, I want you know this region as an inheritance uh, to, to bring people to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, we pray and invite the Holy Spirit to bring about conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So we know that it's the Holy Spirit Spirit who brings conviction. But we can pray for his work. We can invite him to, you know, to do that in our city or our region, wherever we are working. Um, we ask God to draw people to himself. Jesus said, you know, uh, no one can come to me unless the Father draw him. So we say, Lord, draw people in my city to the Lord Jesus Christ. May people feel the pull of God on their hearts drawing them to Jesus. What can we do? Uh, number four, we can pray that God will bring people to repentance and to the knowledge of the truth. Right. So this is in line with 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26. We are praying that people will come to their senses and they will escape the trap of the evil one. 
We can also pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation so the spiritual eyes can be enlightened for them to know the Lord, uh, to know his purpose, to know his power. We can also pray for God to send laborers who will share Jesus and influence them uh, toward the, the Lord for his purposes. And we can pray for signs and wonders, just like our people in Acts 4 prayed. We can say, Lord, we want to see more signs, more wonders taking place um, in our city, you know. So these are some things we can pray for uh, as we engage in intercession for the city, right? Just keep these things in mind. Let it, let it of course, when your times of prayer, let it come spontaneously as the Holy Spirit leads. Uh, as when you get people together uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a community, you can say, hey, let's pray for these things for our city. Pray that God will give the city as an inheritance. Pray for conviction to come. Pray for the Father to draw them. Uh, pray that God will bring people to repentance. Uh, pray that the Spirit of God will open their eyes so that they know Jesus. Uh, pray that there will be more laborers who are sent in uh, to the harvest fields. Pray that there will be mighty signs and wonders demonstrated in our city so that people will come to know Jesus Christ. So all of these things I've, I've given references. So it's based on those scriptures, right? Then we also engage in spiritual warfare. Now, that means we are going to go against what Satan is doing. So we talked about be praying, that you're talking to God for the people. But now we're going to spiritual warfare. That means we're going against Satan on behalf of the people. Now, when we talk about spiritual warfare, we must understand that Satan is a defeated enemy. So Satan is not as big as he pretends to be, right? Uh, we know the scripture. He comes like a roaring lion. So he wants to pretend to be so big, so powerful. Oh, don't trouble me. I'm, I'm very big. I'm bigger than you. No, he's just pretending. The Bible says that Satan has been crushed. He's actually been expelled. That means he's been sent out. You know, he's condemned. He's disarmed. He's destroyed. And he's powerless. And these are all scriptures. Right? Um, he, he's, he's been crushed, he's been expelled, he's been condemned, that means he's judged already, he's been disarmed, uh, he's been destroyed, and he is powerless. So that's how we must look at Satan. So we talk about spiritual warfare, we're going against an enemy whom Jesus already defeated. Secondly, we have complete master and dominion over the enemy. So we are not in any way afraid uh, Jesus has given us authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And we are the ones who are seated at the right hand of the Father in Christ. So we have complete mastery and dominion, dominion over the enemy. And when we talk about spiritual warfare, we're just going to enforce the victory Christ has already obtained for us. So we are not the ones who are contending for victory. Christ already obtained it for us. So we're just enforcing the victory uh, that, that has been provided to us through Jesus Christ. Right? So uh, we keep that in mind as we contend. And number four, uh, we understand that we are protected by God, but we also must keep all entry points closed. So that means we, we are not giving Satan any foothold. We are not keeping any doors open in our lives or in the life of us as a church as we go against Satan and his demons, right? So basically we guard against strife and division and, uh, and those kinds of things because strife, division will give opportunity, will give an open door for the enemy to come in so we protect ourselves, right? And number five, we know that we must speak our authority. So words are important in the spiritual realm. So how do we engage with the enemy? By speaking words and by releasing the word of God over, over our city, over our nation. So words become important. Okay, let me pause here. Everyone's with me so far? Okay. I see your comments in the chat. All right. So uh, I, I'm going over this, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a very quick way because I think uh, most of us uh, know these things. 
and you've studied them uh, in depth in uh, in uh, in the course on on prayer on prayer and intercession also in believers authority okay so i see kiran's question right so lion uh, you're asking um, the lion is symbolic of who so in scripture we find that the lion represents is used for both the lord jesus and satan but different attributes of the lion are ascribed to each right so for jesus he's the lion of the tribe of judah that means he's talking it's here you talk about uh, uh, the lion as a you know, all conquering, the king of the jungle kind of thing. So he, Jesus has all authority, all dominion. Satan is like a roaring lion. So it's talking more about how the lion comes very stealthily. He, he seeks whom he may devour. And he goes about like a roaring lion. It makes noise like that. So the same symbol is used both for Jesus and Satan, but different attributes of that symbol are ascribed. One is kingship, one is dominion, one is authority, that's Jesus. The other one is about stealth and about intimidation uh, that the enemy uses as his tactic. Okay? Okay. All right. So let's do a little bit more and then we'll pause here for today. Pause for today. So I'll just do... All right. Maybe just one or two, right? So how do we exercise spiritual authority over the city? And our goal, of course, is to counteract what Satan is doing. And uh, as we began earlier, we said, uh, you know, Satan uh, try, uh, likes to take people, prisoners, captives, right? Holds them in bondage. So how do we basically enter the strong man's house and bind the strong man and uh, release the prisoners, you know, to spoil his goods. Well, here are some things we can do. Number one is to establish God's presence through praise and worship. So when we praise God, when we exalt him, so praise uh, is, is, is not only a way to establish God, you know, the presence of God, that means we say the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. So we are, we are actually establishing his presence in among the community. But it's also a way, uh, the Bible tells us that it's a weapon against the enemy. Right? Psalm 8 and verse 2, which is also quoted in Matthew 21, verse 16, Jesus says that out of the mouth, um, he just quotes it, he says, out of the mouth of infants, you've ordained praise that you might stop the enemy. So praise, us proclaiming praise stops the enemy. In Psalm 149, verse 6 to 9, it talks about how you know, the high praises of God uh, are, are like a double-edged sword in our hand and we execute vengeance on the enemy. So uh, as we get the community together in praise and worship, that's a way to establish God's presence. That's a way to stop the enemy. That's a way to execute judgment on the enemy. So our praising God, our, just, our worship of God is actually causing this to happen to the enemy. The enemy is being put to stop. The enemy is being bound up and pushed back. So what we are doing is just praising, exalting, glorifying our God. And that's what that's the effect the enemy is experiencing as the body of believers worship um, and praise God, right? So that's a key. We know we know it from Scripture. So that's a key uh, to going against the works of darkness. Just praise, presence, and uh, worship. Okay. Secondly, we declare Christ's finished work for the salvation of souls. Happens. We announce, we come as messengers. So we announce over the city that, that the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed for the salvation of every person. And therefore, we are charging the powers of darkness to take their hands off of the people, to release the people from darkness. So we are enforcing the finished work of Christ, of, of Christ on the cross for people in the city. We're enforcing it by announcing it, by declaring it, 
uh, you know, so in our times of intercession, our times of prayer, we declare over the city, we declare in Jesus' name, the blood of Jesus has been shed for every person in our city. So powers of darkness, release them. Take your hands over them and we speak redemption. We speak release for every person in the city. We speak release and we speak the shed blood of Jesus over the city and we claim the salvation of lost souls in the city. Right? So we are declaring over the city that Jesus Christ has shed his blood for them and therefore we want to, you know, we want to see people set free uh, from whatever the enemy is holding them in the city. Okay. So uh, I will I will stop here. We will pick pick up from here. I know we ten we have still have ten minutes to go, but I think I've given you uh, a lot of a lot of information, uh, and I've and I've covered it very quickly because I'm kind of familiar with it. But what I do want to impress here is that as part of our church planning work, we must engage spiritually, right? And uh, uh, we must get the people to engage. So it's not just uh, uh, you and me praying by ourselves. Of course, we do that. Uh, that's important. But we get people to engage. The, the community comes together to pray. And we understand the spiritual dynamics over the city. And we understand how we can intentionally affect the spiritual dynamics over the city, through our praise, through our worship, and through uh, our prayer and the exercise of authority. Okay? So we must facilitate that. We must encourage believers to engage uh, in that, to bring about a spiritual change over the city. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, there's a question um, Kiran's asking is, uh, is it possible when we are casting demons out, uh, they can attack us? Well, um, they may, okay, let's say this. One, uh, the demons cannot harm us, okay? And I like First John chapter 5, I'll just put this out in the chat. John chapter 5 verse 18, it says, whoever is born of God, keeps himself and that wicked one cannot touch him so who is one of god so we have to guard ourselves of course but that wicked one cannot touch us or the scripture that uh, you know jesus gave in luke 10 19 the verse what jesus said he said i'm giving you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy and nothing will by any means hurt you. Nothing will by any means hurt you. So that's the confidence with which we operate, that the wicked one cannot touch us. Nothing will by any means harm us. Satan cannot. Now, uh, will the enemy try to attack or retaliate? He may try, but he can't prevail. The one thing that gives uh, one one thing that gives enemy access is fear. So the thing is this: you know, many believers are in a, in a, in fear, and they have this presupposition that oh, if I engage in spiritual warfare, the enemy is going to attack, and I will suffer. No, you don't have to have any fear, right? That uh, you know, you you do you serve God boldly. And don't be afraid of any uh, attack of the enemy. If he wants to retaliate, he's going to he'll try and retaliate. In that case, I mean, he'll try to attack anytime. Whether you are attacking or not, he's going to try to attack. He's going to try to tempt. He's going to try to do whatever. That's his job. But the Bible says he cannot touch us. The Bible says no, nothing will by any means harm us. So we are confident in that. If the enemy wants to try, that's up to him. He's going to try anytime, but we, he's not going to prevail. No weapon formed against me will prevail. So that's the confidence we have. So we are, uh, uh, we don't have to be afraid whether the enemy is going to attack the individual or attack the church or attack that movement. We don't have to be afraid. 
is he going to try? Yeah, he'll try. Whether you do anything or not, he's going to try. If you're a child of God or if you're a church of Jesus, he's going to try. But we stand with this confidence that he will not prevail. But we do have one responsibility, that is to be on guard. Right? That's what Job, the scriptures teach us. You know, We have to resist him being firm in the faith. Or we have to be on guard. Or Ephesians says, don't give any place to the devil. Right? So that's our responsibility. And uh, we don't have to be fearful. Okay? Good. All right. Yeah, I think that's it. Any other questions on the chat? Okay. So let's pause here. I, 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 and I've covered a lot of ground, but I want you to think about these things and see how you can get uh, your congregations, uh, people in your city, your area, uh, you know, engaged spiritually, right? Uh, and as much as we talk about all the natural things, the practical things, spiritually also we must be active. Yeah, through prayer, intercession, or worship, we need to engage and uh, see transformation happening. Okay? Think about these things. See how you can use them uh, in the areas where you are serving. We'll close in prayer. I just request um, one of us to uh, just pray and dismiss. Maybe Dave, do you want to pray and dismiss us, please? Sure, Pastor. Father, we thank you, Heavenly Father. We come before you and we thank you for this class that we've learned today, Lord Jesus. And we thank you that we are so blessed. We have learned from such a wonderful man of God, Lord Jesus. We thank you. Help this one, one of us as we move ahead of Lord God. And give us, give each one of us a vision and your the burden to our own cities, Lord Jesus. And so that we can follow whatever we have learned today into our life, Lord Jesus. We thank you and we bless you in the name of Jesus. We pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll pick this up next week. God bless you. I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you, Bye now. Thank you. God bless.